Dr. Harsh for the wonderful introduction. And I would like to thank uh, CIPLA and AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's there. Yeah. You can enlarge the slide. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's it. Go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so I'll be talking on normal tension glaucoma. And as we know, NTG and POAG represent a continuum of open angle glaucomas. While intraocular pressure is a predominant causative risk factor in POAG, additional IOP independent factors, especially the vascular factors are said to have a role in NTG. And uh, this has been uh, emphasized by the previous two speakers also. NTG accounts for a significant percentage of all forms of open angle glaucoma, especially in East Asia. And in Japan, in one of the studies showed that 92% of the POAG had an IOP of less than 21 per millimeter mercury on presentation. And also in Baltimore Eye study, which is a landmark study, almost 60% of the patients had IOP of less than 21 on presentation. So are there any differences in presentation which we see clinically uh, of uh, these patients from POAG. Yes, there are some differences. These patients present with focal rim loss, focal RNFL defects, and the visual fields which are closer to the fixation. And most importantly, there is increased prevalence of disc hemorrhages. So these patients do keep having uh, disc hemorrhages on and off. And also it's been said that NTG patients who present with mean IOP in low teens, that is if they present with the pressures of less than 15, there is a possibility of having different pathogenesis and progression uh, patterns. So let me take you through a few of interesting cases which are suggestive of non-IOP related factors. So this is then one patient who presented to us in 2010. Uh, there was no uh, significant positive history. And uh, on examination, the visual field, uh, the visual acuity was normal, the IOP was normal, open angles, but you see this definite glaucomatous optic neuropathy with optic disc changes and the RNFL changes and corroborative visual field changes in the right eye as well as in the left eye. You can see this inferior RNFL defect and superior visual field defect. So we thought in terms of normal tension glaucoma and we did the diurnal variation along with blood pressure. And that time we could do the trigger fish also 24 hours IOP recording. And as you can see, there was not fluctuation um, much fluctuation for 24 hours. The pachymetry was normal. So we thought it's a normal tension glaucoma and we uh, just probed uh, uh, deep into the history of asking all kinds of history of trauma, steroids, migraine, intolerance to cold, neurological symptoms or difficulty in breathing and so on and so forth. But everything was within normal limits. And uh, even the patient is educated and he wanted to undergo all kinds of investigations to rule out any uh, morbidity, co-associated co-pathologies. So, but everything was normal. So the patient, uh, we put the patient on uh, one anti-glaucoma drop and patient had been following up. And in 2006, we could see some changes here uh, in the visual fields uh, with associated this uh, findings and uh, in the right eye, but in the left eye, it was stable. So we just thought, are we dealing with a progressive normal tension glaucoma in a young patient? Is there any possibility of a vascular anomaly? Since patient didn't give any history of hypertension, we just um, got the ambulatory BP monitoring done and there were some spikes uh, of a rise in intraocular pressure. And again, that time, Dr. Harris and uh, the, he were visiting and and uh, CIPLA was holding a lot of uh, workshops of uh, color Doppler imaging. So we got this patient done and there was some changes in the end diastolic velocity and resistive index. So increase in the resistive index and low end diastolic velocity and suggestive of maybe decreased ophthalmic perfusion pressure and decreased ONH. But however, to our pleasure, this patient has been <clears throat> following up for the last nine years, and you can see the rate of progression is pretty low, just 0.7% per year. So this patient is not progressing that much, and he is a stable patient, a slow progressor, and he is just doing well on one monotherapy. Second patient who presented with a history of acute blood loss, he presented in 2003. 
and uh, the vision was normal, but definitely there was a, a glaucomatous optic neuropathy with the corresponding changes in the visual fields. The uh, DVT and BP was normal. And uh, we just thought it could be a one-time event because he had a history of blood loss and it could be non-progressive. And uh, we didn't that time start him on treatment, but we have been following this patient since 2003 and now 2020, that is 17 years, he has been progressing, although not very fast. The rate of progression is 1.7%, which is considered to be pretty moderate because if it is more than one, it is considered to be moderate. And we have been following up this patient and uh, now he has developed a little bit of cataract and he, we stepped up his treatment. Now the question is, uh, since he wants now cataract surgery, whether we should plan glaucoma surgery or just keep him on maximal medical therapy. So another uh, patient, uh, again, a young patient, obese, male, and he has a family history of glaucoma and he has been taking his uh, depression, uh, antidepressants for the last 20 years. Again, there's no history, uh, positive systemic history. Anterior segment evaluation was normal, but definitely there is some changes in the disc. Here there is some RNFL defect and inferior RNL, uh, NRR thinning in the right eye more as compared to left eye. CCT was normal and there were changes in the fields as well. And uh, again, to our surprise, this patient also progressed uh, over a period of three years and um, just took out his IOP recording from EMR. There was not a single event of high intraocular pressure and he was on one medication. When we probed deep into his history, he did give, his wife gave a history of disturbed sleep cycle, snoring, excessive daytime, sleepiness and fatigue. So we are, could be dealing with an obstructive sleep apnea in this particular patient and he was advised polysomnography. However, we still have to get his reports of uh, polysomnography, but there's a definite history of uh, uh, increased snoring and disturbed sleep. So there's definitely some role of vascular risk factors in causation of NTG. And Flammer, who has done a lot of work in NTG, has described a syndrome which is called primary vascular dysfunction, where there's no not pathological abnormality, but these patients do present with cold extremities, low BP, low th uh, decreased th thirst, and tinnitus and migraine. So etiology of NTG uh, is multifactorial and cardiovascular system evaluation plays a very important role. And so all these factors, as we have already discussed in nocturnal hypotension, uh, autonomic dysfunction, intracranial pressure, and obstructive sleep apnea. And Dr. Murli has already talked about the importance of low perfusion pressure as it increases the risk of development of uh, uh, normal tension glaucoma. So just to emphasize all these systemic factors which are associated with vasospasm or endothelial dysfunction can lead to autoregulatory dysfunction, which is not a very uncommon phenomenon. And it is an imbalance between system, sympathetic and parasympathetic activity with a preponderance of sympathetic system. So eventually leading to autoregulation dysfunction and decreased ocular perfusion uh, pressure. So uh, a word about this obstructive sleep apnea, which is now coming up as an important risk factor for glaucoma and should be ruled out, especially in progressive NTG. And we do get to see patients who have some of these uh, sleep problems. And this is characterized by recurrent, complete or partial interruption of normal breathing due to functional occlusion or collapse of upper airway during sleep, and which leads to decrease in ocular, uh, arterial oxygen saturation and rise in carbon dioxide saturation during sleep. And as a result, decrease in the ocular perfusion pressure and glaucomatous optic neuropathy. So these patients, rather the family members, they gave a history of habitual loud snoring on probing. So this question must be asked to every patient who's slightly obese and who has uh, floppy eyelid syndrome. Um, so this, uh, this uh, history is very important. These patients also complain of lack of energy and reduced concentration, dry throat on waking up and morning headache. And the diagnosis can be made by polysomnography and the severity of disease can be calculated by 
the AHI. And if it is, uh, it basically per hour they calculate the uh, apnea hypercapnia index. If it is more than 15, it is moderate and more than 30 is considered as severe. And CPAP is the gold standard technique uh, to correct this anomalies. And uh, the patients do improve a lot. And the progression of NTG uh, may um, you know, come to a halt when you treat uh, such conditions. So just to summarize, it's very, very important, as has already been said, NTG, we make the diagnosis as a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to rule out POAG. And uh, uh, it's very important because if there is an increased diurnal fluctuation and thin CCT, it could lead to a possible misdiagnosis of NTG, which we do not want to make. And also gonioscopy is very important, a thorough clinical evaluation, because if you don't do gonioscopy, you may miss out on the primary angle closure disease, which can lead to uh, angle uh, uh, to high IOP. And also subtle signs of pigmentary glaucomas and pseudo exfoliation glaucomas, which could lead to episodic rise of IOP. And you can miss them if you don't do a proper evaluation. History, again, if you don't find high IOP, you have to ask history related to migraine, Renaults. You can just feel the hands of the patient, the cold hands, episodes of shock, headache, sleep apnea, and other neurological disorder. Again, very important uh, uh, history which you need to ask is uh, the um, habits of the patient. As we know, the you know increasing water intake in the morning, one to two liters of water, and yoga has become very popular as a for health, obvious health benefits. So you need to rule out excessive water intake in the morning and uh, yoga exercise where the patient holds um, breath or uh, which is done with the head down position. And the history of steroids, again, you have to rule out history of steroids, the skin creams, the systemic on inhalational steroids and use of beta blockers. The systemic uh, history is very important. And in patients where you, uh, if they don't give any history of blood pressure, hypertension, you, uh, and if they're progressing, I think it's a good idea to get a 24 hours uh, blood pressure monitoring. And uh, MRI is not indicated in all patients, uh, unless the patient is a young individual with typical, as Dr. Manish had uh, shown, the neurological field defects respecting the midline or the quadrantopia. And when the disc pallor is more than cupping, you can advise MRI also, and uh, the peripheral vascular diseases. So just a word about the management. Again, IOP reduction is the mainstay of treatment in normal tension glaucoma also, because CNGT study, which is the landmark study for normal tension glaucoma, uh, demonstrated that a 30% reduction favorably influenced the progression of the disease compared with the untreated NTG. So uh, I think IOP reduction is the mainstay, and we still uh, advise PG analog as the first choice of treatment. Although brimonidine and zorzolamide are known to improve, uh, uh, you know, neuroprotection and vasoprotection, surgery may be required in patients who continue to progress even after achieving the expected IOP reduction. But it is rare to see a very fast progressor unless there is some obstruction somewhere in the major vessels. Normal routine, normal tension glaucoma patients, the progression is slow, as I had shown in my patients. Uh, and uh, in a meta-analysis, it was shown that the progression rate is not more than 0.5 per year, which is not very high. So you need not be in a haste to manage these patients surgically. And the role of other agents like, uh, carb, uh, like uh, you know, um, calcium channel blockers and zinc biloba is still not proven yet. But one important point is you need to send the patient for cardiovascular evaluation to identify if there is any nocturnal hypertension or any other problem like that. So to conclude, in NTG, consideration must be given to the vascular factors also, more so if the patient is progressing, although you have to rule out the, the diurnal fluctuation and central corneal thickness and detailed systemic evaluation and uh, history. And uh, till date, controlling IOP remains the mainstay in the management of NTG. However, new protective agents um, are the interesting area of investigation for treatment of NTG for future. Thank you very much for your kind attention.